Good morning, everybody. Welcome again for this new colloquium at the Instituto de Astrofísica de Andalucía in Granada, in Spain. And today we will have the talk by Dr. André Pesinger. Uh, he is from the Escuela Normale Superiore in Pizza, Italy. And he will talk about charting the first billion years with the square kilometer array. André will be properly introduced by Dr. Rainer Schredel. Please, right now. Thank you. Um, so, uh, good morning, everyone, or, or good afternoon, almost. Uh, so, many greetings um, from our director, from Anton, and from Isabel, from the scientific director of the Severo Ochoa program. Both of them, unfortunately, cannot attend and, and uh, send their excuses and, and, and best wishes to Andre. So, Isabel has asked me to uh, present Andre today. Andre Messinger is currently an associate professor of cosmology at the Scuola Normale Superiore in Pisa. He received his PhD at Columbia University in 2006 and subsequently held several postdoctoral fellowships. For example, at Yale, well, or had two postdoctoral fellowships at Yale and at Princeton University. Then he moved to the Scuola Normale Superiore. His research was awarded a Hubble Prize Fellowship in 2008 and an ERC Starting Grant Award in 2015. He has written over 140 peer-reviewed publications with an age index of 51 and edited two books. His research interests are first light, reionization, cosmic 21 centimeter, high redshift galaxies, modeling techniques, machine learning, and Bayesian inference. Is deeply involved in current efforts to detect the cosmic 21 centimeter signal and is the current co chair of the Epoch of Reionization and Cosmic Dawn Science Working Group for the Square Kilometer Array, as well as being an executive board member of the Hydrogen Epoch of Reionization Array collaboration. And today he will talk to us about charting the first billion years of our universe with the Square Kilometer Array. Andre, it's a, it's a pleasure to have you as a Weblocium speaker, and here is all to you now. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that wonderful introduction. It's a pleasure to, to, to be here, virtually uh, be here. Uh, and uh, uh, it's a shame I couldn't be there in person, but, uh, but hopefully we, we, I will, we will rectify that uh, soon. And I look forward to, to visiting and, and chatting with you uh, in person in the near future. So today um, uh, I, I will indeed be talking about uh, this this new potential, the the the, the gold mine, the physics gold mine that will be uh, the square kilometer array, and I'll get to, to why uh, that will be and what we can can learn uh, in a minute. And, and the goal of my talk is mostly to get people excited, get people interested in in what will really be a game changing uh, revolution uh, uh, in in this field. So before. Before uh, um, I get to that, I'll just do a brief introduction about what do I mean the first billion years? What does that encompass? So um, I'm sure you're all familiar with the CMB. The CMB is currently the gold standard uh, for, for, for one of the gold standards for cosmology, uh, providing us with a measurement of the acoustic, uh, the, the baryonic fluctuations uh, at redshift of 1100 or so. Uh, which, which allows us to do um, precision cosmology, one of the tools that allows us to do precision cosmology. Uh, following uh, the, the last scattering surface, following recombination, though these baryons were allowed to, to uh, collapse under, under gravity, they uh, feel the potential wells that, are, that have been established by uh, dark matter. And so they condense into uh, ever, uh, increasing uh, uh, structure of uh, increasing densities and eventually and this is the period called the dark ages the the the, the seeds of structure that have formed uh, as these baryons are now allowed to uh, feel the influence of gravity um, eventually the end result of this process is the formation of the first stars the first galaxies the first uh, stellar black holes and we call this period the cosmic dawn when the first stars lit up their light spread out throughout the universe um, in various wavelengths, as, as I'll touch uh, later on. 
um, and and eventually they, they they established cosmic radiation fields. They this light in, in influenced not only uh, the intergalactic medium where most of the the, the matter resides, but also um, through through feedback processes influenced subsequent star formation inside uh, inside uh, halos in, in galaxies. And this period of cosmic dawn culminated in the last major phase change of our universe, which is the epoch of reunization, where virtually every uh, baryon in the universe was, was ionized. And that, we think, ends at uh, redshift of about uh, five to six. Um, and finally, after that, we have the more the, the buildup of more and more complex structures, more and more massive structures, uh, clusters of galaxies, and uh, and and the uh, the zoo of galaxies that we see today. And so, the first billion years is this is this epoch here that encompasses the dark ages, uh, cosmic dawn and reunization. It's mostly uh, the, the cosmic dawn and reunization epoch, as I'll show in a minute. So you can say, well, well okay, what do we know? Uh, what's the current status about uh, our knowledge for the first billion years? What do we know about the IGM and the galaxies that formed during this time? Well, we know we, know we have some uh, indications of this, and this is really uh, driven by observational progress in the past uh, decade or so. Um, and we're now kind of getting a handle on the timing of the process of reionization. And we are, this is a plot of the, uh, the mean neutral fraction as a function of redshift from one of the latest compendium of constraints. And you can see the kind of the midpoint of reionization we estimate to be uh, roughly 7, 7.5, depending on, on what probes we use. And this is, this is still, um, this is a very uh, recent, as I said, uh, development, although we still don't really understand the uh, the very beginning stages, and we're starting to get a handle on the the, the end stages. But we have a we have a an overall picture. You can ask the analogous thing about what do we know about the heating history, right? Gas has an ionization state, but it all you know, have a temperature, and this is uh, a similar plot showing the mean uh, temperature that well temperature and mean density uh, as a function of redshift. So after um, recombination, uh, the baryons were thermally coupled to the CMB through, through a constant scattering. But then as the universe expanded, the baryons are allowed to cool adiabatically, become colder than the CMB. And then when the first stars form, actually the first uh, X-ray binary uh, stars form, their X-rays have long mean prepassed and they're able to permeate uh, the IGM. And, and I'll get to that also in a minute. Uh, and these X-rays can relatively efficiently heat the, the diffuse IGM, bringing the temperatures up to maybe uh, 100,000 Kelvin, we don't know, um, before the bulk of, of reionization happens. Don't take these redshifts too seriously. This is just a, an old preliminary estimate. And, and reionization then uh, heats the gas to something like 10 to the 4 Kelvin, um, keeping it there in photoionization equilibrium. Uh, eventually, quasars uh, heat uh, uh, doubly ionized helium, which deposits uh, another another uh, a boost in energy. Um, but the important thing to note is that that we have only observations at relatively low redshift. Uh, the redshift, the observations that come primarily from the Lyman Alpha forest, are really only telling us about the late universe, the the, the post redshift five universe. Um, the the early earlier evolution will be uh, probed by 21 centimeter, and I'll get to that in a minute. So we have these kind of rough ideas uh, of of mean evolutions of of the properties of of the gas in the universe, but we really have scratched the surface of this. Really, the, the, this is the, this uh, these periods, the first billion years, are actually the the bulk of our light home, the bulk of our observable universe. And this is a, is a figure adopted for, from uh, Professor Chang. Um, and, and it's actually drawn to scale so that, so that the surface areas that you see in these rings correspond to the relative volumes that are probed in these redshift annuli. And so you can see that the period in the first 10 years above redshift 
uh, fiber. So is, is the bulk of our universe. And, we, and, and can we really, are those two lines that I showed really the most that we can get uh, from the most of our universe? Um, you know, we, we are, we're, we're, it's like we're living in this house and we've seen, you know, the, the wallpaper on the walls. We see our immediate surroundings, but then we don't see the majority of the house. It's in darkness. Like, are we comfortable with that? I, I would say no. I think that we, this is an untapped uh, frontier. And it's inevitable because, again, it's the, the bulk of our universe. So it contains many very uh, fundamental questions that we have about the birth of the first galaxies. Um, it, how do they impact the, each other, their surroundings, the dominant feedback mechanisms that I said, uh, but also dark matter properties. Dark matter provides essentially the scaffolding for the galaxies to grow. And so, and so you know, it, we, can, we can learn about the properties of dark matter uh, from how galaxies evolve. Uh, and also in certain models, as I'll show in a minute, uh, the you know, dark matter can also deposit heat directly into the IGM through, through annihilation. Um, we can look at other cosmological probes. How does the Hubble parameter, for example, evolve during these epochs? Uh, we can study the properties of the first stars, the first black holes, many, many, many more questions. And so, as I said, we're starting to scratch the surface. Um, uh, and then the first, the simplest thing you can do if you look at the, these first galaxies that sit in, this, in these first billion years is to do a census. And so you use the Hubble scope to, to study deep fields, and then you, do, uh, you count galaxies, essentially, at different redshifts. And so after you do that, you get these uh, UV luminosity functions, which are basically just a histogram of how many galaxies per volume you find in a given uh, magnitude bin. So in, in towards the, the, the right um, uh, are fainter galaxies. So the, faint, the deeper you go, the more you integrate the fainter light, the more galaxies you find. And if you do just a simple estimate about where do you think this trend will stop, you realize that we're really seeing just the proverbial tip of the iceberg here, right? So we expect the galaxies to sit at least uh, down to the atomic hydrogen cooling threshold, uh, which should be somewhere around here. Even before that, molecular cooling can cool gas and let it, let it form stars and even fainter objects uh, down here. And so we're missing the vast majority of galaxies. And, and we will also, you know, JWC is a powerful instrument, but, but it won't help us get to the bulk of the population of galaxies. It'll just improve our current limits by something like one to two or, or uh, magnitude. Um, and so it's really, you know, the analogous thing you can think of is if you, were, if you were an alien and you were trying to learn about humans, and the only thing you could see are the wealthiest uh, humans in existence. And so you could, you could make some inferences you could you could you know postulate that okay humans have a head on, on average they have you know two arms two legs uh but you would obviously miss a lot of the a lot of the uh, interesting nuances you might uh, incorrectly presume that that most humans are are rich white uh, uh males you you would miss races you would miss genders you would miss professions businessmen uh, you would miss you would miss uh, a lot of a lot of the details about the bulk of the population from this biased sample that you're getting, and so really, you know, studying these faint galaxies, um, we need another way to do it. So, the route towards progress, well, we can continue learning about the the physics of the brightest galaxies, the few brightest galaxies that we see, um, using JWST, using ALMA, other telescopes. Um, we can continue uh, uh, working on uh, probes of randomization, kind of narrowing down our uncertainty systematic to get the mean randomization history, the you know, curve of the neutral fraction versus redshift. But really, the transformation, the transformative revolution will come from mapping this volume, mapping this first billion years uh, using the 21 centimeter signal. Uh, and from the, these maps, we can indirectly infer uh, uh, the bulk properties of the, of the whole galaxy population. Um, okay, so what is this 21 centimeter line briefly? 
uh, the 21 centimeter line is the spin flip transition of neutral hydrogen. Uh, the, the, in the ground state, the aligned triplet spin is, is, uh, has a higher energy than the anti-aligned spin. And, and this energy difference corresponds to a photon of wavelength 21 centimeter. Um, and so it was discovered uh, theoretically in 1944 and has been used subsequently to map beautiful kinematics of, of neutral gas in our galaxies in nearby galaxies, as you see here. But before reionization, our entire universe was filled with neutral hydrogen. And so how to apply this cosmologically, you, you basically use the CMB as, as a backlight and you, you measure the difference in intensities of the CMB and the H1. And this is in the, it's in the rest frame 21 centimeter. So it's in the Rayleigh gene tail. So, so you typically write this in terms of a brightness temperature because the brightness temperature is proportional to the intensity. And so the CMB photons travel through uh, the universe and they interact with the uh, neutral gas. And as a result, we see this. We have this, this, we hope to see something like this. And this will be the unveiling of, of uh, essentially the, the, our, our Hubble volume. Um, and if you look closely, take a, you know, take a, a slice through this uh, sphere uh, and you zoom in, this is what it looks like. So on, on the vertical axis, you can think of that as an as a angular scale on the, on the sky. And for reference, this is the moon. So this is something like um, eight, eight and a half degrees on the sky. And on the horizontal axis, I'm showing redshift going from redshift 5.5 to 24. And so you can, you can, the thing that's striking is the beautiful dynamic range of this image um, and the wealth of structures that are encoded in this. So if, as we go from earlier times, we have these dark ages that I mentioned, but then as the first uh, stars form, you can see how the patterns are where, the, where these galaxies are located, drive these, these patterns in, in the 21 centimeter field, um, uh, even at very early times. And as I mentioned before, here the gas is adiabatically cool, and so this it's seen in absorption against the CMB. Um, and then when the X-rays heat the gas, as I mentioned before, the the, it, the signal changes from absorption to emission during this uh, uh, transition here, um, which is commonly called the epoch of uh, X-ray heating or the epoch of heating. Um, and then finally, the ep epoch of ionization removes the signal as, as the universe becomes binary. And so this, this, this wealth, this dynamic range is really, uh, if, you, if you expand out uh, the signal, you can see it's driven by the fact that the signal depends on various terms. It depends on the neutral fraction. It depends on the matter density. It depends on the temperature of the gas. Uh, so it has both uh, astrophysical and cosmological terms, making it a very physics-rich probe. So how do we use this information to learn about these unseen galaxies? Well, taking the neutral fraction, for example, this, this allows us to learn about the ionizing properties, the UV ionizing properties of the galaxies. And if you look for, uh, at, at a very simple uh, example of two extremes where you have a model, um, these are from early reionization uh, uh, numerical simulations, where you have a model that has an abundant population of faint galaxies. And here the ionized regions are white and the neutral regions are, are black uh, versus uh, just rare bright galaxies, basically the galaxies that we see. You can see the ionization morphology is very different. Here, there are many, many more ionizing sources. And so you have a lot more smaller regions as the H2 regions grow around these uh, uh, more abundant a uh, more uniformly distributed galaxy population. So even at the same stage in realization, the, 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 the morphology is different. Um, but there's also a temperature term. So you can do the same thing using the temperature term. And so you can look at um, um, different heating uh, mechanisms uh, and probe the X-ray properties that are responsible for heating the gas. And so uh, if you do, a very simple estimates, you, you, you realize that X-ray binaries are likely the dominant heating source at high redshift and low redshift. We, we know that AGN dominate the X-ray background, but as you go to higher and higher redshift, something around just five or six, depending on your estimates, 
um, AGN become increasingly rare and the dominant uh, population that sets the X-ray background are X-ray binary stars. These are stars that, that grow up in binaries and, and one of them is a compact object and it then accretes uh, uh, gas from a massive companion and, and emits an X-ray. Um, and so if you take two SCDs, the, uh, you can imagine we don't really know the SCDs very well of these objects and if the SCD is hard so that it has more um, harder high energy photons, these photons have a, have a longer mean free path and so you can see that they would heat the IgM more uniformly. This is a temperature distribution if you assume a hard SCD versus a soft SCD. You can see that the patterns here in the hard case are more washed out. And these differences are detectable which means that we should be able to also, also learn about the, the shape of the SCD of these first galaxies indirectly because we're not going to be able to see them. Um, so there's a lot of wealth that, that, that is encoded in this about the first galaxies. The, the patterns and the timing of this, this map tells us about the, these properties, but it's also a hugely data rich probe. And that's something that really us in the field, we haven't gotten uh, comfortable with yet. We're not used to thinking about that. We're, we're, we're used to being data starved and you see one, one quasar and you get really, really excited. But this is going to be a 3D signal with many orders of magnitude more independent mode than, than for example, in the TMB, which is currently the gold standard in cosmology. Um, uh, so, so it's going to really uh, drive a big data revolution in the field. Um, and so how do you take advantage of the data, big data revolution? Well, the obvious thing, if you can do it, is to, to, is to forward model. Uh, uh, forward model the, the signal and then compare your models to the observation. And so this is something that I've spent the last 10 um, years uh, working towards. And the, the goal is to have something like this. This is a mock observation. Again, it's, a, it's just a 2D slice through this kind of cosmic light cone with redshift increasing along this direction. Um, it's, it's, it's a mock observation, so it's not, uh, um, it, it, we don't have a real observation yet, but eventually we'll have a, a map. And then you need to characterize this observation using some summary statistic. And that's a whole other genre of, of my research because there's no obvious choice of summary statistic because it's a non-Gaussian map. So if, so if it were Gaussian like the CMB, you can do a power spectrum analysis and not lose information. This is, this is somewhat non-Gaussian, so there might be better uh, summary statistics. But still, the power spectrum is, is still an obvious choice. And then you can take the slide cone, cut it into chunks. You compute in each chunk a power spectrum, and that's what's shown here. These are in increasing redshift, the power spectrum computed from the mock observation. And then we put, estimate some noise. This is a thousand hours noise from, in this case, it was from the HERA telescope. Um, and then we excise modes also at large scales that we expect are dominated by, by foregrounds from our galaxy. And so, so from this mock observation, you can also combine it with other observations because this is not the only piece of the puzzle. We also have the UV luminosity functions that I mentioned uh, at the beginning. This is actual data that we have in hand. We also have estimates of the optical depth uh, to the CMB, or, uh, um, uh, and, and so that, that tells us about the integral constraint of reionization. You can combine these pieces to do inference, and so by and forward model. And so what, what that means is you sample the parameters uh, that govern the astrophysics of your galaxies, that govern physical cosmology, as well as any residual systematics, and you create realizations of the data. And for each realization, you compare with the observation. And so I, I have a, a movie here that shows this, that starts from some, some uh, initial sampling that uses the EMT uh, sampler. And you can see just a random sample from, from the, the current uh, change shown here with the corresponding power spectrum here um, and the, and the uh, light uh, luminosity functions shown here. And so you can see as, as this MCMC evolves, you can see uh, the, the posterior is starting to converge. Uh, it's bringing up the samples 
uh, uh, to converge on the observation. You can see visually, in this case, the seed was chosen. So visually, you can compare against the mock, but in practice, we use different cosmological seeds when we do this inference. And you can see that at the end, we recover um, our uh, galaxy parameters here um, to very high precision, percent level precision. So this is, this is uh, well, what do we need to, to what do we need to actually do this that I mentioned this is the goal? Well, there are several pieces to this, obviously. You need efficient simulations. Uh, uh, by efficient, it means it means you need to call it uh, hundreds of thousands of times, however many you need for 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 your estimate to converge to converge. Uh, and there need to be parametrized in some way so that you have a parametric uh, model for the cosmology. Uh, galaxy for physics and systematics. Obviously, you need observations because you need to compare your theory to the observations, and you need a quantitative way way of comparing that. And there's really only one uh, quantitative way, which is the the base theorem. One, well, let's say, rigorous way of doing it, which is the base theorem. And so let me go through these these kind of steps. Uh, so first, we need to simulate the universe. The problem with simulating the first billion years is that there's a huge range of scales involved. So ultimately, we want to learn about the first stars, the first black holes, uh, from cosmic radiation fields. And these are inhomogeneous on scales of 100 megaparsec, tens of tens of 100 megaparsecs. But ultimately, they're driven by, by small-scale structure, clumps, and, and stars and galaxies. So we need a subgrade approach. Uh, and, and we do this by uh, cutting off uh, the scales such that uh, on linear and quasi-linear scales, we can simulate things more or less directly. Uh, the density field and velocity field are simulated with uh, uh, higher order perturbation theory. And then we have uh, prescriptions for quick radiation field simulation. And then the, galaxy, uh, per, the galaxies and the clumps are simulated using a subgrid a parametrized subgrade physics. Um, and so this, this, the code that we use is, is called 20 centimeter fast. Um, it's, it's something that I started developing uh, in, when I was a, a postdoc. Um, but the, it, using these kind of approximate prescriptions, we're able to uh, dramatically cut the computational cost of large scale simulations um, at, the, at the expense of uh, a, a modest loss in accuracy. So here on the left, you see uh, the a mock 21 centimeter uh, image um, from a, a high dynamic plus radio transfer simulation. Um, and here you see the same, using the same initial conditions from 21 centimeter fast. And you can see on large scales, and we quantify this in the paper, uh, something like about one megaparsec, the, the, the two are, are converged. The, power spectra, for example, are converged to within 20% or so. But the dramatic thing is that here you have uh, 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 something like eight orders of magnitude drop in computational cost in these two things, which means that you can use this for one of these, you can, you can run 10 to the eight of these and actually map out the parameter space of, of uncertainties. It's been widely used uh, around the world. It's, it's being used to interpret data from all the 21 centimeter experiments. It's a public code. So if you're interested, um, you can go on GitHub and, and uh, find it. The reason why simulating 21 centimeter signal itself is especially challenging compared to other probes is precisely because it is a physics rich probe. It encodes a lot of physics. And so you start with the density and the, uh, the matter field, which contains uh, galaxies. And here I show these light cone slices, but they're inverted so that the redshift increases along this direction. You can see structures forming a cosmic web forming as time increases. And these galaxies that sit in this matter field, they drive radiation backgrounds, and one needs to follow various radiation backgrounds, ionizing to for ionization, X-rays for heating, Lyman Werner, Lyman Alpha, uh, and these radiation backgrounds then. Uh, impact the subsequent formation of galaxies through feedback mechanisms. Um, and, 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 and ionizing photons, for example, photoheat the gas, making it more difficult for gas to pool and collapse onto, onto um, dark matter halos. Uh, but also the photons in the Lyman-Werner band, the soft UV band, disassociate molecular hydrogen 
which which removes the cooling mechanism for the very first galaxies and makes it more difficult for the very the, the first galaxies to form stars. Um, and so you can see then at the end the these these radiation backgrounds re lead to uh, the 21 centimeter signal that looks like what I've showed before. But but you can see from this that that at different times of uh, at different epochs, cosmic epochs, the structures here are driven by different fields here, which which is really the the power of this approach. You can see the fluctuations here are driven by the uh, ionization fields here. Here you can see they're driven by by the the, the first the very first galaxies, uh, uh, the densities. And so you can see the, the reason why this is such a physics rich probe, why it's so the dynamic range is so large. Um, just to illustrate this uh, even further, this is a movie from uh, this evolution of 20 centimeter structure progress, which is an ultra large scale public realization, a 1.5 gigaparsec uh, in size. And, and just to put that in context, uh, this roughly corresponds to the size of the uh, state-of-the-art uh, hydrodynamic plus RT simulation. Um, so we can, we're able to reach much, much larger scales. And here I show the movie uh, evolving uh, from Redshift 35. You can see the global 21 centimeter signal here. You can see the, the power spectrum in the above panel as structures form, as they heat the IGM, and as they then ionize the IGM, uh, removing the signal. And so then you can ask, well, okay, you talk about these galaxies in a kind of abstract way. Uh, what galaxy parameterization are you using? Well, I think there's two things to, to keep in mind. Uh, uh, there is no singular galaxy parameterization that, that, that is the right one. Um, however, uh, uh, you're, you're aided by a couple of things. One is that this is a Bayesian framework. So you can, you can change your galaxy parameterization you want and look at like something like the Bayesian evidence to, to see which is, which is uh, uh, favored by the data. But then the other thing is that the, the observable signal is actually sourced on relatively large scale. So if I look at one of these light cones with redshift increasing in this direction, and I look at the slice through this, this is, is now simulating the resolution of a single frequency slice. So this is uh, on sky uh, uh, slice using noise as well as, as foreground excision. So this is kind of a pessimistic uh, model, but you can still see that the fluctuations that remain, there are fluctuations and they, they, they constrain a lot of our physics, but there you lose the small scale structure. You lose structure on, on scales below 10 megaparsecs or so. And what this means is that, that each of these fluctuations is sourced by uh, uh, tens, maybe even hundreds of galaxies, which means that you can use scaling relations. If you don't have to model individual galaxies, you can use uh, ensemble averages. Whenever you ensemble average something that has a characteristic mean, you, you have to get, uh, using the central limit theorem, you have to get log normal distribution. And so that's shown here. This is this is a, a very flexible parameterization, very simple parameterization of uh, astrophysics, where we take uh, a power law for the stellar to halo mass relation, and in fact, that is what observations see that that, that there is a power law uh, that has a free parameter with, with which is the the amplitude and the scaling. We also take a characteristic star formation time scale, which is scales with the dynamical time of the galaxies. Uh, we allow the ionizing escape fraction to again be a power law with the halo mass, and then on small scales we we uh, uh, account for the fact that galaxies have difficulty in cooling uh, and forming stars below a certain uh, halo mass with a characteristic turnover. And you can see that these uh, parameters, some of them are already constrained by uh, current observations like the luminosity function. You, you can't have stellar halo mass relations that are too steep, but then others like escape fraction uh, are only poorly constrained at the well, at least using this data, um, and and the small the faint end turnover is not constrained at all. Um, and these kind of scaling relations are just a natural product, as I said, of of population averaging, and they you can these kind of models can characterize very different simulations, they all are reasonably characterized by this. This is from a hydrodynamical simulation using very different parameters for star formation. Um, also semi-analytic models, they result in these, these power law uh, 
relations, some observations using abundance matching, they seem to follow these trends. We also need to characterize the X-ray properties. Uh, and this is, we do this using the, the the X-ray luminosity, the star formation rate relation. And this is the expected STD from a theoretical model. And so we have parameters that characterize the luminosity and the shape of this STD and, uh, and the self-absorption by the galaxy turnover. Um, and so you can see, as again, some of these parameters are already constrained, uh, uh, others not so much, especially, for example, X-ray parameters as you, as whoops, uh, the current observations don't constrain the X-ray parameters at all. I don't know why this is not moving. Ah, whatever. But the 21 centimeter signal shown above will. Does. It, it impacts strongly the, the 21 centimeter signal. So these are the simulations. Um, what are the observations? I showed a, a, uh, uh, an example using a mock observation. Um, but actually, we, we do have some observations currently in hand. Unfortunately, we only have upper limits. This is a compendium of the currently available upper limits uh, from, from first generation telescopes like MWA, LOFAR, uh, uh, and, and HERA. And you can see that the limits, this is the expected signal. This is the power spectrum as a function of redshift. You can see the upper limits are still several orders of magnitude away from where we think the signal lies. But we are now starting to get, as time progresses, these, these become lower and lower as we understand the systematics better. Um, and in particular, I'm gonna talk about these two lowest limits that we got recently in pink. And they were obtained by this SK precursor instrument called the Hydrogen Epoch Organization Array. Uh, it, is, it is built in South Africa. This is an actual satellite image. It's not a, it's not a mock. Um, it's fully built, it's rolled out, it's, it's, it's doing um, observations using a subsample of antennas as, as more and more uh, antennas are able to be better characterized and understood. Uh, so it's progressing uh, well. And so last year, the, the collaboration, uh, we published a, 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 a first uh, result using about 10% of the antennas and using just uh, 18 nights of observations using four fields shown here, it's a drift scan telescope. So the sky falls above you and you measure. And these are the observations in red uh, from the different bands. Band one is, is redshift, corresponds to redshift of 10, band two corresponds to redshift of eight. And uh, again, the power spectrum here is, is relatively large, but these observations are consistent uh, uh, with the thermal noise estimate, which is shown here in black, except for the very large scales where, where it's still dominated by foregrounds and systematics. And so these, these we definitely, uh, these are not consistent with thermal noise. So again, there, there's still two orders of magnitude above the suspected signal, but can you still, can you, can you say something with this? So that's the question. So you need, you need, you can, you can in fact rule out, you potentially can rule out very extreme models that, that are, uh, that have very large power. And so what kind of models are the first things that you can rule out? Well, you can look at this equation that I wrote here for the, the brightness temperature, the, the signal, um, and you can go through the terms. This is the ionization fraction. So this can vary from zero to one. Uh, uh, so it doesn't help us with this prefactor of, of 30 very much. Um, this is the density field, uh, again, on large scales that you measure the density, uh, maybe the tens of percent to, to to something like two, uh, you don't get much much range here. Um, you don't get much of a help here. But then, if you look at this temperature term, so here we have the uh, CMB temperature uh, in the numerator. In the denominator, we have the gas temperature, the spin temperature of the gas, which is coupled to the uh, to the uh, gas temperature. And so, when the gas is hotter than the CMB, you can see that this term saturates to one. But when the gas is colder than the CMB during this adiabatic expansion, uh, for example, at redshift 10, the CMB would be uh, roughly 30, and the adiabatic limit would be something like 2 Kelvin. So you can get a factor of 15 or so boost from this term um, if the gas is cold. 
And so these kind of models, now you're talking because you have a factor of 15 to, to help you with, this, uh, uh, with, with the amplitude of the signal. So the first models to be ruled out are, have to be cold. But this is what, these are the models that can get up to those large upper limits. So we require that the gas is much, much cooler than the CMB. And you also need to have, because you're not measuring the global signal, you're measuring spatial fluctuation. You also need to have spatial fluctuation uh, driven by something. So you could have spatial fluctuations in any other term, like ionization fraction, as we saw, ionization is a patchy process. So you, you, you of course, have fluctuations in that. You can have fluctuations just purely by the matter power spectrum. Um, and you could potentially have fluctuation in temperature itself, but this, this is unrealistic because the uh, X-rays generally have long entry path, and so, so you can't get sharp uh, temperature fluctuations. You would need a very unrealistically soft FED. Um, and this is an example of what these things look like. For example, this is uh, a, a slice through simulation where uh, the gas is cold, but you have these black patches around galaxies that have been ionized versus where the gas is still cold and there's no reionization. And so the, in this case, instead of these black patches, you have over densities in the matter field. And so basically this is just a probe of the matter power spectrum with this additional boost in the, in the, in the mean from, the, from the, um, the coldness of the IGM. And so in both of these cases, the, the upper limits are exceeded in the power spectrum. But as I started off this uh, talk, we do know already something about the EOR. So, so this, is, this is one of those things like, if the EOR is ongoing, then, and then we can constrain the temperature of the IGM. But we don't have to have that if, because we actually have other additional constraints in the EOR. We know at redshift table where the observations are, the EORs are going. So there are some, some, some fluctuations there. So that means that we can actually, you know, uh, not, not constrain a conditional statement, but actually constrain the temperature of the IGM using this observation. Um, so before everybody gets too excited, it's important to realize that these are, these are still upper limits, as I said, at two redshifts and, and a couple orders of magnitude above where we expect the signal to lie. So instead of what I showed before, it's, it's just kind of these upper limits roughly here. Uh, uh, so we're not gonna get uh, very strong constraints. Um, but we do get some constraints, and this is this is the posterior from this uh, from our HERA uh, analysis paper. Um, and in purple is what we currently know using uh, current observations of luminosity functions in the OR history. And in purple is if we add in now these HERA upper limits, and you can see that it doesn't help much except for this one parameter. And this indeed is the X-ray luminosity per unit star formation rate. This, this is the X-ray luminosity that is doing the heating. And if we don't include HERA, we have a, a flat prior because we don't have any observations that's constrained the temperature of the IGM. But now when we include these preliminary observations, we have this posterior, which is actually disfavoring uh, current observations of, of local X-ray binary luminosities, which sit here at, at something like one and a half sigma. And the reason is that we know that local X-ray binaries actually uh, have a strong dependence on the metallicity of their environment. Low metallicity X-ray binaries have trouble uh, driving winds, and so they have increased mass uh, accretion, and so they're brighter per unit star formation rate. And this is a couple of models for how this should evolve in this, in this low metallicity environment where we expect the first galaxies to lie. So this is consistent actually with what theoretical predictions are that the first galaxies are more X-ray luminous um, than, 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 than local uh, galaxies. I think I'm running a little bit low on time, so maybe I'll, I'll speed up. Um, so you can ask what can, we, what can we learn using full data, using like a proper detection with thousand hours while you get all sorts of beautiful uh, constraints. Uh, all parameters are roughly constrained to percent level uh, of precision. We, we detect a faint population indirectly that we don't detect using current luminosity function observations. And the UR history is, is almost a, a giveaway. Like this, this, we constrain it to, to better than 1% precision or roughly at 1% precision. So we get a lot of stuff. Um, 
and the other thing is like the, you know I've demonstrated this with with this flexible galaxy model, but but it's important to note that because this is a fully Bayesian, you can change the galaxy model, and we, we demonstrated this in this paper uh, using a more complex galaxy model, and use the data to to, to use the rate, the evidence ratios to uh, see if the data prefers a more sophisticated model. And there's so much data uh, upcoming in this that you can have a strong preference, even though by eye that you can you know find very strong degeneracies, the data will allow us to, to actually infer the galaxy model. So briefly, uh, I'll spend a few minutes, the final minutes talking about um, physical cosmology. I've, I've so far been talking about galaxies, but it's also a rich problem of physical cosmology. So the simplest thing you can think of, well, well there's this matter term equation so maybe we can find a, a cosmic epoch or a piece of, of the sky where we can probe the matter power spectrum directly that might be challenging to do a clean uh, signal so the next thing that you can uh, do which, which you should do is just co-vary the cosmological parameters in the inference um, and, and you get something like this uh, triangle plot where you can co-vary both and if you marginalize out uh, the uh, astrophysics in this paper, we showed that, that, that you could improve constraints on something like sigma eight from the current Planck uh, prior, the current Planck uh, results, which are used here as a prior. Um, you can get more exotic heating mechanisms. This is, this is a paper uh, computing how much we expect uh, dark matter annihilations to heat the intergalactic medium. And this is a different form of heating than the galaxies because ga the dark matter is distributed uh, almost uniformly compared to the galaxy with a bias of, of, of one. And so the heating is deposited in a very uniform way. So, so it's not uh, degenerate with the, uh, in, in the fluctuations, it's not degenerate with galaxy heating. Um, and that's something we're continuing also with collaborators, uh, uh, Laura and, and, and others. Um, with, by coupling 21 centimeter fast with dark history and looking at different, um, uh, looking at how, how different heating histories can evolve depending on the different annihilation products. Uh, another thing which, which I think is really exciting is to use, uh, you can use uh, potentially these, these fluctuations as a standard ruler. So if I run this movie that I showed before, and I stop it at this point, and you look at the power spectrum, you start to, you, you, you see some wiggles here, right? And you could say, well, okay, maybe those are, are cosmic variants, but the actual, the cosmic variant sets in over here. These are hugely large. These are 1.5 gigaparsec simulations, and these are 100 megaparsec scales. So what is that? Well, those are actually acoustic oscillations that we see in the signal. So we see uh, acoustic oscillations just come from, from uh, over densities in the quantum fluctuations uh, that then in the, the photon baryon fluid, uh, as, as, it, as it expands, uh, it then ends up uh, stopping uh, at, at recombination and that freezes in a certain scale, the sound horizon scale uh, at recombination. And this scale, this characteristic scale is imprinted in the galaxy formation because uh, it, it results in a velocity difference between the baryons, which have been dragged along in this fluid, and the dark matter, which has been collapsing the whole while. And you can, in, this has been noted by Sostrakovich uh, and Hirata in a paper a decade ago, but simulations have, have studied this in more detail. And if you look at regions in the universe that have a low velocity offset between the baryons and dark matter, compared to ones that have a high velocity offset, galaxies form much more difficultly in regions that have a high velocity offset because the gas just kind of streams past and doesn't increase in the dark matter halo. And so we incorporate this in our simulations and you can see this characteristic sound horizon scales appearing in the, uh, in the maps. This is a map without velocity and this is with velocity. You can see these scales and that's actually what, what these fluctuations are. This is, these are, this, these are uh, so-called acoustic oscillations in the velocity offset field and that are easily measurable, which would, would allow us to set a cosmic ruler in this, in this regime that's so far untapped uh, during the, the, the cosmic dawn and, and kind of tie in estimates of how H should evolve over cosmic time, which right now, as you know, there's a tension from estimates from the CMB 
and from local estimates. All right, so I will conclude here. I apologize for running a little bit over time. Um, so the to conclude, the you know we we have this uh, Bayesian, fully Bayesian forward modeling framework, which allows us to on the fly uh, forward model 3D light cones of various fields, and 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 we can use this toolkit to learn about the first galaxies using upcoming 21 centimeter observations, which will provide us with these fluctuations, these, these 3D maps that we can compare to our models. Um, and if we look at what we expect from, from SKA, which is starting to be built, uh, I, should I should mention that, that SKA has started its construction. And so, you know, we expect to get first data within a few years. Um, we, we will be able to constrain galaxy properties from the, the patterns in these maps and the timing to percent level precision. Um, but even preliminary data that is two orders of magnitude above the expected signal uh, allows us to, to increase what we currently know. Uh, it allows us to constrain the heating history during the cosmic dawn. And it actually tells us that as, as we expect, but now we have actual data, the, the first galaxies are more X-ray luminous than local ones. And this is expected from the fact that they, they live in low metallicity environments. Um, it also was a probe of physical cosmology. It's a, it's a Bayesian framework again, so you can pull very cosmological and astrophysical parameters. You could, you know, vary parameters to change the matter transfer function. It, you know, people have, have done this. Uh, there's a lot of, a lot of, lot of uh, studies in this area that can be done. You can also include exotic heating processes from uh, dark matter annihilations and decay. Um, but you can also find the standard ruler uh, in, in, these, in these measurements from acoustic oscillations that imprint a velocity difference in the, in the dark matter and the baryons. Um, and again, the analysis is fully Bayesian. So you can, you can change your model, you can change your model for, for galaxies, you can change your model for dark matter, uh, do the inference and compare the evidences. And you can actually then use the data to learn about the physics, which is going to be a powerful way of, 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 of thinking about the first billion years. And uh, that's it. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Andre, for this uh, very nice talk. <clears throat> and now <clears throat> and the talk is open for uh, questions. Questions uh, will be managed by Teresa. So Teresa, now you are co amphitryon co-host here, uh, you should see the uh, rise at hand on your screen. So, uh, yes, or actually, let me see here. I, I'm just gonna make sure I can see all the participants. I think so. Okay, I, I thank you so much, Andre. This was uh, quite an interesting talk and uh, I'm gonna take the opportunity because I'm talking to, to ask you two questions myself, if you don't mind. So uh, I, I, just a comment, there is a lot of uh, H1 expertise here, but mainly perhaps on the nearby universe. So I find it personally super interesting and exciting to see how versatile uh, H1 observations are and how we can use it to, to constrain the parameters of the cosmic dawn. And uh, also very, very exciting to hear about Hera, which is a, an SKA precursor that uh, isn't always so much in the limelight as for instance, uh, mm. uh, Meerkat and so on. So uh, uh, one of the things I thought was really cool is when you're mentioning, oh, you just need to simulate the universe. And which sounds like <laughs> quite a task. And I remember in my PhD studies, I was uh, modeling the H1 contents of, of the galaxies and i felt super cool when i was doing this so uh, my my first question was just really what kind of data power do you need to 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 simulate the universe to model the cosmic dawn h1 content uh, and you you mentioned briefly this 21 centimeter fast and i saw a slide on network of stations but but i, I missed that a little bit so <laughs> yeah so i mean the 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 idea is that is that we have these kind of approximate approximations that we make. And so, for example, the, the matter field you can do quickly using 12PT, because again, these are scales you, you, that, that you observe are scales on relatively large scales. You're not observed directly galaxies, you observe fluctuations on 
10 megaparsec scales or, or you know, maybe a few to 10 megaparsec scales and above. Um, so, so 2LPT is, is perfectly fine, uh, but then it's the radiation fields that end up being uh, more challenging and you can't afford to do radiative transfer. Instead, what you can do is you can do, uh, uh, again, averaging over, over spherical shells in kind of the light cone. And you can say for each gas element, uh, you can count the, you know, the emissivity in certain uh, shells surrounding that gas element. And you can actually store that because these are just FFTs, they're quick to evaluate. And you can store that in memory. There's a lot of like, you know, efficiency hacks uh, that allow us to compute this in a, in a reasonably quick way. Um, and so, you know, at the end, you can do one of these realizations roughly in, in one hour, if you do like a, a good resolution uh, um, simulation on, on like a single core, which is, which is not bad, but it does mean that to do like 10 to the, you know, uh, the, the, the inferences that I've shown were done with something like 100,000 or 10,000, well, 20,000 live points, uh, 100,000 samples, something like this. You do need a cluster and you need a couple of weeks on a cluster to do it, but you know, still you you have you know a uh, <laughs> uh, hundred thousand then samples from from a posterior of a universe, which which then is, is great. You can post process that to do machine learning. We're doing that actively and various other things. Okay, that's awesome. That's that's impressive. <laughs> uh, actually, could I ask you, you to maybe unshare your screen? It will be easier to see everyone. Ah, sorry. There we go and see uh, raised hands. So uh, I do have another question, but I actually always ask every co-chair of, of a SKA working group. And it's the SKA is kind of famous for the ability of commensal use of the data. And maybe I should have you, warned you about this because people are usually more into your own use of the data. But uh, do you know anything about how uh, he, uh, the upcoming data that we, we, you would use for this research might be used in other areas as well? Um, well, yeah, I mean, the, the, the raw data is, is at, well, not the raw data, but, but some version of the process data is going to be shared. So the, the stuff that I was showing can, comes from, uh, will come from SK Low. Um, SK is already used by uh, other, uh, uh, other groups like Pulsars or Creative Life um, um, and others. And so there are some commonalities in how the data is processed. So some of the data products will be, will be publicly available and, and other research groups uh, can use it. Um, from our end, we, we tend to make everything public. So, so the codes are public, the, you know, the, the posteriors are public. Um, you know, you, people are welcome to check you know, the research that we did using their own tools. Uh, so there is, there is kind of a philosophy of, of making things uh, public as much as possible. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, do we have any other questions here? I'm unsure if I'm actually seeing everyone. No other questions? I think you're gonna have to, to, to yell them out if you have one because I my screen seems weird. And if not, I'll- um, Teresa, there is Reiner. I, oh yes, hi. I have a question which is kind of really on a side topic here since I'm not into 21 centimeter, et cetera, but, but I missed again the, could you, would you kindly repeat the explanation why metal poor X-ray binaries are more luminous than metal rich X-ray binaries, Andre? Yeah, uh, so that's, that's, that's an empirical observe, observation that can show the slide that shows this. Um, it's empirically observed in local star forming galaxies. So let me find the, the slide uh, to show the data. Um, but it's theoretically also expected if you, from people that do uh, modeling of, of the first, why can't I find this? They do, do theoretical models, models of X-ray binaries. Um, and the reason is because 
you you have inefficient winds. When you go to low metallicity environments, you have uh, 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 a less mass loss because I can't find. It. Okay, but you get you get the less mass loss because the metals help couple the, so the radiation the radiation pressure. Right, you refer to mass right. loss. From the accretion is not from the companion. It's it's from the companion. So the companion object ends up. Uh, with low metallicity, it ends up preserving its outer envelope because it doesn't have the metals to to drive winds because the metals are required for efficient cu coupling of the radiation pressure that pushes out uh, the winds. So the okay. companion ends up being more massive. It has mo more of its atmosphere that then gets dumped onto the binary. That is true for massive X-ray binaries, also for low mass. Yes, massive X-ray. For massive X-ray binaries, the low massive ones take a long time for okay. the companion to evolve, and they they dig in later. I have a, another plot of that that I can now I get it. Thanks a lot. Okay. Okay. okay, thanks a lot. All right. Anyone else? If not, I'd like to say a big, big, big thank you again for, for uh, giving this presentation and uh, found it very illuminating. And I'll hand the word over to Rene again. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Andre, for the talk. And thank you. Everybody, see you tomorrow. We have another talk by Jose Luis Gomez, and he will talk about the uh, new image of the black hole. Thank All you. Right. Thank you very much. And take care. Bye. Bye. Thank you.